So uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. G. L. Pimentel, who is going to talk about uh, bootstrapping cosmological fluctuation. He's from University of Amsterdam, and he's jointly associated with University of Leiden, a Netherlands. And he is going to talk about three papers which uh, he had written in the board. And uh, he's actually working with uh, many, many collaborators on this topic. And he will try to cover some of the aspects that he have studied. So it's a uh, uh, very, uh, we are feeling very nice that you are agreed to give, be giving the talk and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, so now you can start. Sure, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I made it blackboard because we can uh, go in various directions. So I encourage you to interrupt and ask questions throughout the talk. So this is uh, based on, uh, on work with uh, Nima, Arkani Hamad, Daniel Bauman, Hayden Lee, uh, Carlos Duazo Pueyo, and Austin Joyce. And uh, it's based on these three papers. There is a lot of earlier work. And then uh, uh, Bauman Green, Arkani Hamad Maldacena, Nomi Yamaguchi. Yokoyama. So there's there's a whole uh, list of pe uh, people. Bzowski, um Skanderis, McFadden, uh, and uh, I'm I'm sure I'm not going to be able to do justice to to uh, the number of people that have worked on this uh, topic of uh, trying to understand the theory of cosmological correlations in a more or less model independent way, and. I encourage you to take a look at the references. We try to make the references uh, fairly complete. And uh, so I, I will probably not give uh, enough references. I'll just focus on the physics during so, the talk. Uh, uh, by model independent way, what do you actually mean? Without uh, I'll, any I'll, potential? I'll get there. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah the, the, the idea is to try to understand the the possible shapes of cosmological correlation functions without having a specific model in mind. So the, usually the way we do uh, inf inflationary perturbation theory, for example, is you pose a certain inflationary model, you have a certain scenario in your mind, and then you uh, take the scenario further and compute its observational consequences. And we want to understand what is it that you can say about the general shapes of uh, cosmological correlation functions without referring to specific model. And then your job as a model builder will be to take from a certain menu of possibilities, which possibilities you, you want and maybe dial some parameters. But the actual theory of shapes, I'd like to claim that at least for a certain class of inflationary models um, is constrained just by, by uh, basic uh, rules of physics so that's the idea so i guess that that's the answer to your question but okay yeah please interrupt me i'll be happy to to uh, clarify throughout the talk so the given that I, I, if i understood correctly it's a one hour and a half talk yeah so i, I will try to make it in three blocks and uh maybe we'll maybe we make it to the third block so the the first uh, part, I'll, I'll try to do some motivation uh, and maybe maybe it'll be a little bit shorter than the other blocks. And then the first part uh, is related to scalar, primordial scalar fluctuations. It's mostly based on these two papers. And finally, I'll say a bit about uh, uh, bootstrapping tensor fluctuations in which there are some interesting new, uh, new, new inputs, new physical uh ideas that have to come in so the the first thing is to understand is the motivation so the all uh all cosmological measurements because uh you know cosmology is is not really an experimental science we just run the universe once so we have to observe it it's observational so in a sense all we can do is measure correlation functions in the sky and uh, we do that, so we have the, the CMV here, and we have uh, maybe the large, we have some dark ages that we still can't probe directly. Then we have this, the large scale structure of the universe. 
time goes up. And here we are somewhere observing the distribution of galaxies and the distribution of uh, hot and cold spots in the, in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And then we produce this, uh, this nice plots of the temperature two point function delta T over T delta T over T as a function of separation. It is a function of, uh, of multipoles. And you've seen these uh, beautiful plots from Planck, for example, with acoustic peaks and whatnot. Likewise, you can do the same thing for the matter power spectrum. It is a function of uh, wave number. Uh, and then you plot delta rho delta rho over rho bar, delta rho over rho bar as a function of separation. And again, you see some plot so like this. Here, rho bar is the background. That's right, yeah. yeah. It's the average density of uh, say dark matter. Then if, if we push these things all the way back to the theory of initial conditions of the universe. So this is at the Big Bang. Uh, so this is an input of our standard cosmological model. And uh, for, for the hot Big Bang, what we need is a two-point function uh, in, the in the primordial Newtonian potential that roughly looks like this. It's a translational invariant. So it, it, uh, if we go to momentum space, I can uh, think of it in terms of Fourier modes on this spatial slice. And because of translation invariance, there is a delta function of momentum conservation. So I'm just uh, on the support of the delta function, k and minus k. And um, you will have some amplitudes, amplitude divided by k cubed plus uh, uh, some small deviation. Okay, so this is these are inputs of our standard cosmological model, the amplitude of primordial scalar fluctuations and the deviation from uh, exact scale invariance. Okay, so if we input that, then we can explain the observations. We have a, a small tilt if I plot uh, k cubed phi phi is the function of k and um, well, they're imprinted at the hot Big Bang, so they look a-causal, right? And we know since the 80s a good solution to this problem, which is the idea of inflation. And so the idea of inflation is that the universe undergoes exponential expansion. And uh, for, for the purpose of this talk, I will approximate inflation by the sitter space. And that will turn out to be very useful. There, there are, of course, uh, uh, from model builder perspective, you need to be able to stop at the sitter phase. But for the modes we probe in the sky, this is a good enough approximation. Okay. And then spontaneous so to, part. To end that thing, you need a little bit quasi de sitter approximation or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we, we, will, we will see how uh, you implement that in practice. But I'll, I'll work uh, on the assumption that the fluctuations are sourced in an exact de Sitter background. And then later, uh, maybe towards the end of this motivation part, I'll say how you do a small deformation okay. of the Sitter fluctuations to get the inflationary fluctuations. Okay. So essentially, what we see in the sky is coming from some spontaneous pair production. Uh, and then uh, exponential expansion will drive these uh, two points apart from each other, and, and that's uh, and that's how we get that's how we get the the initial conditions. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we know from experiments, and uh, because inflation is a gravitational theory, and also because we expect the Hubble scale during inflation to be quite high, uh, we don't know, in fact what the Hubble scale is, but uh, from a model builder's perspective, a typical scale that you can get, for example, in large field models of inflation could be 10 to the 14 GeV or something like that. So quite high. So then it gives the, pos the, the possibility, exciting possibility of using this as a particle collider. So in order to, you know, that's, uh, that's one motivation for 
Well, first of all, if this is the theory that generates the initial conditions, we should understand it as much as we possibly can. Second, if it's such a high energy phenomenon, we should try to explore uh, what uh, consequences it has for our uh, general picture of the universe. Maybe it gives us access into the universe at extremely high energies. And uh, the question is, how do you probe uh, those energy scales? And the answer is in higher point correlation functions. So that's the main focus of the talk. So this is what we know from data and uh, important experimental targets is to understand beyond the two point function. Okay, so that's one motivation. So uh, try to connect fundamental theory, the, the theory that sources the initial conditions to observations. So this is the first motivation. Um, so maybe I'll make a little diagram here. So there are these cosmological correlators. So it's connected to observational to observational cosmology observations. So we measure them uh, indirectly through the measurements of the uh, late universe tracers, and it's also uh, related to the physics of inflation. Ultimately, that's where the initial conditions come from, or we have strong evidence that it comes from inflation. And uh, now uh, I want to claim that uh, it has a strong connection to the study of uh, scattering amplitudes in flat space. Scattering amplitudes. You, because this is a phenomenon happen at a very high energy scales, you can see it as, a, as a, some particle collider experiment. So this is, uh, this is an idea that has been around for quite a while, but I'd say that in the past couple of years, we made this uh, connection quite precise. So this is the idea of uh, inflation as a, a particle collider. So here the scattering amplitude connection is in the flat space. Yeah, so there, there, is, a, there is a, so if I take the cosmological correlator, first of all, uh, it's very analogous to the type of experiment that you would do in particle physics to measure scattering. Mm -hmm. And later in the talk, I'll show you that there is a certain limit of the cosmological correlator in which it essentially reduces to a flat space scattering amplitude. Okay. So you could imagine some uh, scenario that uh, we are just starting to understand. And I think that there is a, a lot to be done in which you, you, we know a lot about the structure of uh, flat space scattering amplitudes and you could imagine leveraging this up, uplifting this to some uh, new understanding about the structure of cosmological correlators. Okay. So this is the dream, but um, we, know, we still know very little. I'll show you, uh, we understand a few things about tree level, um, but uh, there is a whole universe of uh, interesting phenomena in the physics of scattering amplitudes that should have cosmological analog. So I think that this is a quite interesting connection. And uh, in, a, in a more phenomenological uh, vein, this, uh, the idea of using the uh, early universe as a particle collider is also what people call the, the, the slogan coined by Niemann Juan Maldacena is a cosmological collider physics. Hmm. Okay, so that's the. So this is the slogan. The idea has been around uh, on and off for for quite some time, but uh, yeah, I think that the 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 call to try to understand uh, this uh, phenomenon from the point of view of a collider experiment became a very crisp. Uh, after this paper. Okay, so this is another connection that I'll try to make precise during the talk. And uh, finally, there is a certain flavor of a holography, very, very underdeveloped holography, very far from uh, 
from our understanding of holography in string theory in space times with negative cosmological constants. But we can leverage some of our understanding of holography in ADS to try to understand the theory of the fluctuations just by anchoring ourselves to this late time boundary. So if you're not familiar with uh, holography and string theory, the idea is that in quantum gravity, the natural observables live in the boundary of space time. And uh, in fact, sometimes there are questions that are easier to answer just by anchoring yourself to the boundary without making reference to explicit bulk of time evolution or, or radial evolution in the case of ADS. So, so we're exactly gonna we're gonna Exactly yeah, sure, which so. quantity uh, you uh, want to connect in holography? Uh, like yeah, so so here the objects of our interest are these cosmological correlators, and these cosmological correlators from the bulk perspective they are evaluated at a fixed time. Okay. Okay. And uh, there is uh, yeah, so you can ask yourself a question just anchored on this late time surface from the point of view of inflation. And uh, we'll see how asking a specific question that doesn't make reference to time evolution will give us rise to a consistent time evolution during inflation. So it's a very baby version of the hologram because we're not doing explicit time integrals. We're asking a question just related to spatial correlations here at the boundary and, and yet uh, we see that the answer to this question knows about uh, consistent time evolution. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so this is the, and yeah, so so usually people refer to this as some sort of DSCFT, and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna use a little bit of this uh, uh, idea in the sense that um, the natural symmetry natural isometries of uh, inflation, they act on this late time surface as the action of the conformal group of phase transitions. Okay? So we can use CFT technology, in particular in the second paper that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we can use some CFT technology to understand cosmological correlation functions without having to uh, going back to the drawing boards for every new calculation we need to do. Okay, so that's uh, that's the map, uh, more or less. And I think that's, uh, yeah, so to finish the motivation, I'll just to say a few more words about the actual observable that we're interested in, which is the, which is the higher point correlation function. So the, um, the main star of this talk will be, uh, okay, so first of all, from the point of view of inflation, so I'm deleting the late universe. From the point of view of inflation, this is the end of inflation. And uh, what we've seen in the sky is coming from this uh, two points diagram. Okay. Uh, it's coming from essentially a very light scalar field. Inflation makes, uh, because it's a gravitational theory, it has another inevitable light degree of freedom that doesn't redshift away to late times, which is the graviton. So these are the two main uh, uh, probes for, for our particle collider. And then the idea is that if we now, uh, maybe I stretch this a little bit. So from the point of view of our collider, uh, if we want to probe the, the or infer the existence of new particles, then uh, the idea is to go to higher point functions. So for example, if you want to understand how this, uh, uh, this uh, scalar particle self interacts, so you can imagine probing a three point function or how it interacts with the gravitons so, uh, something like this. So you, by measuring these uh, 
higher point correlation function, you discover some information related to the physics of interactions. But uh, perhaps even more exciting is the prospect of if you go to say four points, and I'm gonna focus on the second part of the talk at four points with uh, scalars on the outside, uh, we have the possibility of probing a new state. Okay, maybe there's a new state that is heavy, but uh, heavy in, uh, but not so heavy in Hubble units, something of mass order Hubble. Mass order Hubble or mass over Hubble order one. So it can be produced, it's not Boltzmann suppressed, the, the spontaneous pair production rate. But because it's heavy, its power gets redshifted away as inflation carries on. So you can't measure it directly. If you try to measure it directly, there would be very little power because it's a heavy field. But you can imagine that it, uh, it lives for a short period and leaves some interesting non-trivial correlation among uh, uh, the four inflationary fluctuations. Okay, there are lights and can survive to late times. Can uh, yeah. anybody consider like action or something like that would be like this kind of degrees of freedom? Well, I'm, I'm going to be agnostic about the, the fact that it's an axion just uh, implies that it's a very light scalar field. I'm going to be agnostic okay. about, uh, uh, yeah, for a lot of what I'm going to say, you can think of this as any spectator field okay. in the sitter space, in particular an axion. And then uh, at some point, I'm going to start making some assumptions to connect the curvature of okay. fluctuations. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah. just one uh, question. So once you incorporate this thing, uh, it's true that you are not seeing this in the boundary, the because the power is very small. But yes. uh, why you are incorporating this effect? Uh, what is actually going to modify? It? That's why you are taking care of this kind of uh, exchange or additional degrees of freedom. Yeah, the, the question is, is not why; it's what if. So okay. what if there is an extra? So we don't know what's the physics of inflation. So we should keep an open mind. Maybe it's strings, weekly couple strings, or maybe some other degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like, uh, like in the case of uh, you know, weak interactions, right? So we see these, uh, these self interactions of fermions. And uh, then when we zoom in, then we start uncovering that there is some massive gauge boson responsible for the exchange interaction. So it's a similar thing here. Maybe there are some new degrees of freedom that teach us something about the actual physics of what drove inflation. And then uh, I'm trying to ask the question, how would we in principle learn about these uh, degrees of freedom? So in a collider, I can crank up the energy of the collider. I can change the impact parameter of the True. beams. True. And I, I learn about the new states here. I only have access to these correlations in the sky. So the question is, once I give you a correlator, mm -hmm. what can I, what, what, how do I read off in its functional form? How can I infer the existence of a new state? Okay. That's, the, that's the question. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's the, that's the idea. So, so even though it might be hard or impossible to probe a, a, a massive state, we can infer it, uh, its uh, power or uh, its features. Uh, sorry for the interruption one, one time. Uh, so correlation you are calculating, these are all Euclidean vacuum. Yes, uh, I will say a few words uh, about the choice of initial state. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to assume that the fluctuations start their life in the Euclidean vacuum. Okay. So if you're interested in things like alpha vacua, then um, I, I can comment a little bit. Uh, there are, from this bootstrap perspective, there are solutions that seem compatible with the Sitter symmetries that have singularities that you would associate with alpha vacua. But I don't, I mean, the solutions exist, but I'm very confused as to how to make them happen from bulk perturbation theory. So even though they exist and I can write them down, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, how to 
actually bring them up to life from from the standard time evolution picture. Okay. 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 More, they, they, these modified initial state um, correlations they have a very nice feature that uh, they they produce a lot of signal in the physical sheets. So they have singularities or the power grows uh, around a certain configuration, this so-called folded configuration when you align some of the points in the sky and so on. So, uh, I mean, from th they're interesting on their own to consider, but uh, if, you're, if I'm playing devil's advocate, we probably should have seen something hmm. related to those already because they predict a lot of signal in the sky. So you have to, I mean, I'm sure there, there are ways around it, but um, yeah, I'll get, I'll get to it later in the talk of how you would see the solutions associated to these modified initial states. Okay. Okay, very good. So, so this, this will be, this will be the, the, the main character. And for weakly coupled fluctuations, that's uh, pretty much it. And, uh, and uh, because in the sitter space, so here the sitter becomes important. The fact that we have the sitter space are, are, as our inflationary arena implies a couple of things. It implies that the two point function is, uh, is unique. The shape is unique. The only thing that it tells us is the mass and the spin of the external state. Okay. So given the mass and the spin, I can determine the two point function. And uh, for, uh, for all practical purposes, the scalar fluctuation and the graviton have m squared equals zero, and then spin equals zero for the scalar, two for the graviton, okay? If you never thought about this subject before and you're curious about spin one, in four dimensions, it just so happens that spin one is conformally coupled, so its power is redshifted away. So it's more like a massive particle, a massless spin one particle. So we're going to focus on these two, two cases of external probes. Okay. From now at three points, at three points uh, for scalars and gravitons, there are these choices. Um, <laughs> and uh, three gravitons and uh, and uh, one graviton, two scalars. Now here there's already something interesting, okay? So the sitter symmetry tells us that the shape is unique. There is a single three-point function for uh, for each one of these choices, okay. Uh, but uh, these these two cases are a little bit different than these two other cases. So the first thing I want to say is that at three points, the only choice you have in the sitter space is that there is a unique shape, and as a model builder, the only thing you can do is you can crank up and down the strength of these uh, three-point function, okay? And this is really the sitter symmetry. If you had just a scale symmetry, you could have an infinite number of uh, shapes at three points, okay? But the fact that we have the sitter symmetry, which I, I'll review I, in I a think, second. I think one question. Uh, can you please ask? Uh, is it me? Uh, yeah, may I? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, may, may, may I ask, uh, in terms of safety language, what is this M and S? Yeah, so in terms of uh, S is S, spin, and M, uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's something like uh, M squared uh, over H squared. Well, sorry, it's delta equals uh, zero or, or, or three, okay? So from ADS CFT point of view, you would say I that see. it's a del delta equals three. So uh, is it anomalous dimension or something like that? It's the conformal dimension. It's just oh, okay. uh, you, tr you trade the, qu the quantum number yeah. uh, by, 
Yeah, so this is in cosmology, what happens when you solve the, the, the wave equation for, for your quantum field in, in the sitter, as you go to very late times, there's gonna be, if I take a field phi, and I go to very late times, which are in conformal time is conformal time going to zero. You're gonna have eta to the delta, or yeah, delta yeah. minus uh, eta to the delta plus, O plus. Yeah. If you're familiar with ADS CFT, you usually control one of these, and you measure. So this, one of these is a C number that you control, and the other is a response, right? Hmm. Which you associate to CFT data. In cosmology, we only control the initial states of the universe, and then both of these will show up at late times, but one of them uh, exponentially decays and the other survives. So the eta to the zero survives, and the eta cube decays. Mm -hmm. The correlators of uh, these two guys are easily related by some shadow transform. Mm -hmm. And uh, to make contact with the CFT literature, even though what we care about is the eta to the zero, what survives late times, I'm gonna focus on the delta equals three, because that's what a CFT person will I talk see. about. But Thank there is you. an easy translation, yeah, sure. Okay, so. Is there another question? Can you please ask? So you said uh, the shape of the three point function is constrained. Is that a statement only about three? Because I feel like, like for four point functions, like, there could be like many classes uh, as opposed to That's a three right. point function. Is that a specific yeah. statement about? Okay, and That's you take some kind of a limit to get. Yeah, I'll get three there. point function. Yeah, like yeah. So, you so I, I just oh, want, okay, okay. the the first argument is that the three point function is unique, so it seems too constraining. But the four point function, there are infinitely many shapes. And then, uh, uh, then the, the, the distinction between the sitter and inflation becomes important. There is a small deformation of the sitter four-point function that will give rise to an inflationary three-point function. And that's why in inflation, already at three points, there are so many possibilities. You, can, you should think of them as the sitter four-point functions. Yeah. So uh, I just want to ask one thing. So this uh, three-point scalar and three-point graviton uh, both of them uh, are calculated uh, a long time ago, one by Maldacina and one by Maldacina and probably you. Yeah, what? Well, no, sorry, I'm, you? I'm just asking. Are you right? That's the question, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so, so these two shapes. No, no, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about these two. I'm talking about the three scalar and three graviton. So this is three scalar. Right. Uh, and the three graviton is the other one. Uh, yeah. yeah, this one. So, so yeah, I, I will comment in a second at what Maldacena computed. Yeah, what he computed. Okay, maybe I'll comment now. So, so this is this. Yeah. So, assuming exact the sitter symmetry, you only have these choices. Okay, and uh, what Maldacena Maldacena computed these four correlators for slow row inflation. Mm -hmm. which is not the same as pure this heater, mm -hmm. uh, but his computations reduce uh, essentially to, to, for this example, th that's why I put this divide here. Uh, these two examples match what he did, and these two don't. And uh, I wanna explain why these, these two are not. And I, well, yeah. So let, let me say a couple words about these uh, guys in the sitter, and then I'll explain why these two don't match Maldacena's, um, Maldacena's answer. Okay. Uh, so from the point of view of, uh, of the bulk writing a cubic um, vertex, so because this is unique, you can imagine uh, writing the simplest possible bulk interaction, which would be phi cubed, okay? Uh, so this is what will give rise to this three-point function, but this is bad, okay? This is bad because in inflation, we expect the potential that uh, drives the fluctuations to be very flat. Mm -hmm. We want the, the, the background to be the sitter space to a very good approximation. So there is some reflection of these facts in the theory of the fluctuations. So even if this vertex is around in the theory of the fluctuations, it's highly suppressed. In particular, it's not the leading 
cubic interaction, even in the slow row approximation. There is a certain limit in which this will be the leading vertex, but um, this will not match what's in Mal, what is in Maldacena's paper. Okay? Now this, this guy here, it turns out that uh, the, the vertex you need to write looks like this. I think R squared phi, where R is the bulk uh, Riemann tensor. So it's irrelevant. It's a higher derivative operator. So it's not going to show up in slow row inflation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why it doesn't match model center. Now for this guy here, um, there are two possibilities. One, the Einstein gravity possibility. And this was in, in Juan's paper. And then um, uh, around nine years later, uh, him and I pointed out uh, that uh, there's another possibility coming from bio cubes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I still claim that uh, the answer is essentially unique. There are two possibilities because there are different uh, helicity assignments to the graviton. So if you think of every helicity state of the graviton as a separate state, then the answer is more or less unique. Okay. So, so in Juan's original paper, he computed the shape coming from Einstein gravity. And finally, this one here is also coming from from Einstein gravity. Actually, it's, it's sort of coming from the kinetic term of the inflaton, d phi squared, because there's a metric hidden here. So when you expand the kinetic term of the inflaton, there will be a g mu nu, d mu phi, d nu phi, which gives rise to this uh, correlator. And the connection uh, between uh, uh, this and a, and a CFT calculation was pointed out by uh, Mata, Kundu, Trivedj, and Raju, I think. It's a paper called CMB from CFT from 2012. So these shapes are not coming from slow row. So these ones match slow row, slow row inflation. But these two don't, okay? But in the Sitter space, this is, these are all the possibilities for the three point function. And then uh, it comes the, the, the question that was raised uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, so how do we get a plethora of possibilities for the sitter for inflationary three-point functions? So the idea, which was uh, actually goes back to Criminelli, but it was uh, made precise again by uh, some Jeep and uh, Raju Gosh, forgetting fourth author. It's a fairly recent paper from 2014. So it's a criminelli 13 and then uh, Raju, Raju, Trivedi, Gosh. Um, I have the guy's face in my in front of me, but uh, I forget any right? 2014 or so. Um, the idea is that you, you can think of an inflationary, uh, the, an inflationary three point function as a limit. Uh, sorry, let me, let me remain consistent with the color. You have, you have an inflationary three-point function, and so cr criminelli O3. Um, an inflationary three-point function, you can think of it as a limit of, uh, of a De Sitter four-point function in which one lag is essentially the time-dependent background. So if I take, if I take uh, uh, the De Sitter four-point function, in Criminelli's case, it was coming from d phi to the four, the first uh, term in the EFT of the inflaton that uh, will correct the speed of sound of the inflaton. And now if I take one of the legs to be phi equals phi bar of t, the inflationary background, I'm going to automatically generate some phi bar dots times uh, uh, plus the fluctuation phi phi bar dots, um, phi dots, d phi squared. Automatically generate a cubic vertex, okay? 
so that's the idea so then uh, that uh, well that that tells us the blueprint so at four points at uh, weekly coupled uh, interactions i have this general diagram so it means i can do a deformation of the diagram uh, Okay, and this will give me an inflationary three point function regardless of which state. Let me just, this state is generic. Okay, uh, so, so now, uh, so, so this gives us the blueprint. Okay, so the three point function in inflation has enough juice in it to probe uh, general features of new states as a function of their mass and the spin. So we want understanding the in the inflationary three point function, how we read off information about the mass and the spin. But if we understand this diagram in the sitter, the four point function in the sitter, there is a small deformation of it. It's essentially we take K4 to zero, the, the long wavelength limits of this fourth uh, fluctuation. And uh, there's a little bit I'm sweeping under the rug that I can get to later. Uh, there, I have to deform the mass of these states a little bit to create some redshift and not kill the signal completely. And, uh, and then this three point function here will know something about this state. Okay, so now we can go back to these two examples and answer the question of what is it that Maldacena actually computed. And uh, these authors had already figured out the answer for this example. And in our paper from last week, we show that uh, this example is essentially the same story. So because we're doing slow row inflation, in the end, in the case of Maldacena, there's no extra degree of freedom. So the only thing that you can exchange is the, is the scalar fluctuation itself and the graviton, right? But in the case of the scalar fluctuation, well, we have some cubic vertex here. Uh, and uh, yeah, we don't, we we expect to be suppressed, okay? Uh, because it's the similar similar argument as here why we don't like phi cubed. So what's left is the graviton. Okay, so essentially, uh, these uh, authors pointed out that uh, a way to get Maldacena's answer is to take this soft limit for the graviton exchange diagram. Okay, so here, graviton. And in our paper from last week, we uh, showed I have a good question. Uh, yes. In the case of the flat space, when you take one of the leg to be soft, then the amplitude tend to vanish. So That's in, the, right. in the case of D sitter, it seems like you know, like you're taking one of the leg to be soft and still have some non-trivial. No, 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 it, it, will, it will vanish. There is an Adler zero, just like in flat space. Yeah. That's why yeah. I said I'm sweeping something under the rug. What you need to do here is you need to give this extra leg a tiny mass. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you work perturbatively in the mass and then uh, the final answer will have, so if I, if I make the mass or the conformal dimension here to be uh, three plus epsilon, okay? So some mm -hmm. tiny deformation of the mass, then this answer will have an epsilon up front. It would vanish if I take uh -huh. the exact massless limit. It's exactly as you, you would imagine from flat space. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so yeah, so these are the, the relevant diagrams, but now uh, if we wanna do this cosmological collider physics, it's our goal or where we're interested in understanding this for any state, okay? No, we're going to be agnostic about the theory and we'll try to understand the general structure of this diagram. Uh, in particular, this diagram, because if we understand this diagram, then everything else follows from the formations of this particular diagram. Okay, so that with this, I'm done with the motivation. So before I dive into the four point diagram, maybe there are there any more questions? All right.
so uh, here in the uh, the criminal uh, criminalist version when people compute in the cft side so what is the dotted uh, term in that case yeah so uh, in uh, cft language you would take um, so you have this uh, this uh, bulk inflaton okay now you look at it at late times it's going to have some eta to the delta minus o minus of uh, of x plus eta to the delta plus o plus of x delta minus and delta plus are determined by the mass of the particle so for the case of uh, inflaton is uh, is three and zero um, so uh, what we're going to study are the eta cubed parts so we would look at o minus of x1 o minus of x4 go to fourier space you'd have ok1 ok2 ok4 and now you do two things um first you you want to send k you want to send k4 to zero to emulate this soft limit but as was alluded in the last question if i do this uh i kill off the the correlator because it's a it's a shift symmetric okay so what you do is you deform the mass you instead of making eta cubed you make three plus epsilon okay and then you send, so you make this leg three plus epsilon, and then you take limits k4 to zero. And that will give you essentially that three point function there. So this three point function now will depend on ok1, ok2, ok3. It won't look conformal symmetric because it's descending from a four point function. So this four point function realizes the sitter symmetries with these assignments of uh, conformal weights but then i do some deformation of it i take the soft limit and then i get the the inflationary by spectrum so if you do this for uh and I'll, I'll explain how you classify these contact interactions if you do this for the simplest possible contact interaction that shift symmetric and take these limits you get criminalis density okay all right very good so maybe i'll start for clean slates let's do scalars sorry i do have a very trivial question uh, yes why do you need to you you can directly calculate the three-point function uh, why do you need to take this limit to calculate it Ah, for a couple for a couple of reasons. Um, first, you also compute the four point function, which is the leading four point function in inflation. Second, you can leverage the full the sitter symmetry groups uh, to understand the four point function, then take the limits. Well, there is no uh, um, there. At least I don't know exactly how to gun straight for the three point function because the the, the sitter symmetries act nicely on the four point function so i don't know if there's a way to go straight for the inflationary three point function so that's uh, so again at four points the the sitter symmetries act nicely on the correlator so we would like to understand them on their own right they're interesting and they're the leading inflationary four point function moreover once i have those i can take a limit and get the inflationary three point function and uh, if I understood your question, you're asking, well, why can't I go straight for the Decider three-point function? And um, I, I think it's because the Decider symmetries act nicely on the full four-point function. They shift the momentum four around. And in the end, the, the inflationary three-point function is the four-point function at a particular value of K4. So you would need to find uh, a set of the Decider symmetries that don't touch leg four somehow to be able to go straight for this uh, OK4 or SK4 goes to zero. Okay. Okay. 
you can ask the question again if I'm not uh, answering. It. Sorry, just, just to get one information. Are you saying that the direct calculation of three-point function in DCTER is not possible? Is, is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I, I'm saying that if you go straight for the three-point function in DCTER, the answer is unique. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we know that there are many, in particular, they, they, because it's unique, it's coming from complex interactions. It won't allow you to run this uh, collider program, right? And uh, we want to know about new states and so on. And uh, then you should go at four points. At four points, you will learn about new states. Moreover, actually, if you relax the exact, the sitter symmetry, and you go to inflation, even at three points, there is already rich physics because you can think of this inflationary three-point function as the decider four-point function. If you insist in pure decider, then the three-point function is completely unique and you learn nothing about uh, new states. Okay. 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 All right, so we're gonna do the four point, the, uh, maybe my, sorry, my phone is dying, my headphone is dying, so I will. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, great, sorry about that. All right, so um, let's carry on. I don't have much light. Very good, so now our, our goal is to understand scalars. And uh, in particular, four-point function. So for the four-point function, we'll be interested and in the case in which I, uh, I'm trying to exchange a particle of mass m and spin s when the external states have m squared equals zero. Okay, so this is our our main target. So now I claim. So the claim is that. You can get here if you understand this simpler diagram. So if you understand the diagram where m squared equals to two in Hubble units, and I exchange a scalar particle of any mass, so spin equals zero. If I understand this four-point function, then I understand this, this one general spin and mass equals zero, okay? And um, this is because of the Sitter symmetry. Because of the Sitter symmetry, if I understand this diagram, I understand this one. And uh, we can get into why it's possible later, but um, there is some technology that leverages conformal symmetries that allow, will allow me to take the expression for this diagram and essentially apply a bunch of derivatives to it. If I apply these derivatives to this diagram, I get this diagram for free. Okay, so this is where the Sitter symmetry is very powerful. Okay. So that's, that's, um, this is uh, what we did in the paper from, uh, from uh, uh, 2019. 2019 we show in detail how, how you do this. It's leveraging this weight shifting technology of conformal field theory. Okay, so we're gonna focus now uh, in order to understand the dynamics of, uh, so this is all kinematics. Okay, so this is all kinematics. So, uh, one question, this mass is constant. Sorry? This mass is constant profile. So I need to raise the volume. So this mass is what? Mass is constant. Yeah, yeah. So the, I, I'm going to take the external probe.
to be massive, m squared equals two, these are conformally coupled scalars, and their power gets redshifted away, but I can still look at some cosmological correlator shape. I just, I, I want to uh, just ask one thing uh, that, like maybe not related to your calculation. If this math have some kind of time dependent profile, then uh, how to compute that? You mean if I give you some M of T? Yeah. Then, uh, then I I'd claim that you're breaking the zero symmetry. Okay. So if you do that, uh, then uh, this formalism will not will not work. Okay. 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 Maybe if the breaking is very small, you can uh, you can control it. But uh, there are a bunch of interesting scenarios in inflation where this happens, and I don't know how to run this bootstrap in that case. Okay. Uh, from the phenomenological point of view, you don't expect to see the signature of conformally coupled scalars in in in, in experiments, or is that no? Because uh, they are a bit like gauge fields, so their power gets redshifted away. So you wouldn't see them. Uh, yeah. So their their correlation functions. I have a conformally coupled scalar. Uh, they they go at late times like uh, like eta conformal time square. So in uh, eta minus two h t. So they decay exponentially fast. So you won't see them. Uh, that's a famous challenge, by the way, going back to, to vector fields. So we don't know how to generate. Well, you, you need to do quite some gymnastics to generate primordial magnetic fields during inflation. And we do see them in the intergalactic medium. So it's still a bit of an interesting challenge how, how to generate them. OK, so this will be our objects. So if we look at, uh, 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 I'm going to refer to m squared equals 2h squared, conformally coupled. Scalars. I'm going to refer to them as phi of, of x and eta. And um, if, I, if I go to Fourier space, I go to Fourier space, phi k1, Phi k2, phi k3, phi k4. The, cor the correlation function evaluated at a fixed time. As time, conformal time goes to zero at late times uh, during inflation, you will redshift away. The power will redshift away as eta to the four, if I remember correctly. So you would say, wow, well, I don't care, right? The, the power redshifts away. But I'm interested in the leftover shape, of the function of the case that appears up front here. So this will be the object that we'll, we'll be interested in, okay? And then I claim that if we understand these objects here, there is a certain operation that will take us to the actual inflationary correlator of uh, some uh, very light massless, for all practical purposes massless, in which, as I send eta to zero, there will be eta to the zero. There is no suppression at late time. There are going to be some new shape tilde of ki. And the claim is that f tilde of ki is some operator that depends on the, on the three momenta of the particles applied to f. And this is a non-trivial statement. It's coming from uh, representation theory of the decider group, okay? So that's the, so the, the related to the conformally coupled scalar, this to the master scalar. So that's the claim, okay? Um, maybe just a technical point, but are you gonna be talking about the wave function or when you say correlators, will be talking about the correlators or maybe that'll be- um, I will probably not make the distinction during the talk, but uh, because it's 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 subtle for all for almost all practical purposes, because I'm looking at uh, at these uh, conformal dimensions that are related to shadow. You can think of them as the wave function, 
there is some specific boundary condition that picks the wave function versus the correlator. But uh, because I'm not being super technical here, I will not make this distinction. OK. But uh, I'm happy to, to, uh, to discuss uh, this uh, maybe after the talk, if you're interested. Excuse me, may, may, I, may I ask? This, this f function are, uh, they are kinematics. They are, they are fully fixed by symmetry or? No, at four points, they're not. So they are, the, 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 the idea is that this function, uh, the Sitter symmetry allows you to write like a, an infinite family of those. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to impose some dynamical constraints to pick a specific choice. Mm -hmm. But then the claim is that once you have this particular choice, then there's something determined by kinematics that will give you some analogous I dynamics see. in terms of the massless scales. I see. Yeah. So it, it is important. To, and that's why uh, we're going to focus on this example, because if we understand the dynamics in this example, then the, 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 for the rest of the story, everything is determined by kinematics, at least uh, for external scalars. For, for this conformal scalar, sorry, for this conformal scalar example, in the end, you can write the compact form uh, for this f. Is that what you are trying to claim? Uh, I can write something that we have a total control over. I, see. I, I can call it a hypergeometric function with indices and whatnot, whether you call it compact or not. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I see. For very specific choices of the mass of the internal states, then it uh, it simplifies quite a bit. So, for example, if this internal state is uh, is massless or m squared equals two, then mm -hmm. become some dialogues. If the, you have a spinning particle that is like a, of zero mass or so-called discrete series, then uh, it's a rational function actually. So, for specific mm -hmm. choices, it uh, simplifies quite a bit. But for general mass, it's some complicated hypergeometric generalized hypergeometric function. But the point is just to, to understand yeah to understand how you what is the where 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 is the dynamical input that will pick a, a, this particular hypergeometric function as the solution to this, to this. I see, I see. thank you. Yeah last thing is if you actually care about it, this shape numerically and uh, if we understand uh, where it comes from, it's a bit like the theory of the Bessel function. You, it, I'm going to write some equation that determines this uh, this shape, and we know how to write it to uh, approximate it by elementary functions around any kinematical channel and uh, so on. So, yeah, I see. I see. Thank but you. If you want a fully general answer, then it's uh, it, it, the most compact way that I know how to write it is in terms of some generalized hypergeometric functions. All right. So, yeah, so this is, this is kinematics, but uh, as a, sorry, I can't see the name of who asked this question, so I just have to mention it. So the, the, the previous um, question is, is very important because dynamics will tell me which objects I feed in as a seed to generate something here uh, for the scalars, okay? And uh, we're going to focus, because we're interested in weakly coupled fluctuations, we're going to focus on two examples. And actually, one is the stepping stone for the other. Example one is when we have um, contacts-like interactions. And example two is when we have a uh, three-level exchange, which is uh, our goal to do this cosmological collider physics. And so we want to. We want to have uh, these two diagrams. And actually, this is an important stepping stone to understand this diagram. So we're going to go here first. Sorry, one question, one little question. This theta, uh, this theta of k that you have written, that, that depends on what exchange that you have, right? It, sorry, it depends on what uh, exchange that I have? Yeah, uh, the, you know, the, what internal state that you are taking. Um, well, okay. If I'm looking at this S channel type of uh, diagram, then um, yeah, being a bit more technical, these operators are bi are bilinears, so they like to act on pairs of operators. 
So I would like to, if I'm if I have some something where I have one two here and three four, I would like the bilinear to act on the left and on the right. Okay, and um, I think that kinematically nothing prevents me from taking a bilinear that acts on these two uh, guys here and on these two guys here. But I suspect, uh, and I haven't spelled this out completely, but I suspect that you're going to get some garbage results here in the sense of getting something that is not coming from good dynamics. If you want to get a result in which the dynamics is similar to the dynamics of the seed process, you want these bilinears to act uh, either on the left or on the right for this type of diagram. I don't know if that's... Uh, I see. So, so, so my question was more, uh, when you say phi, 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 this four letter, uh, do you mean that is uh, that is computed with a particular exchange, at the, either with the graviton or with a scalar exchange? What exactly? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. So, so um, if I have here, uh, so so the seed will dictate what the result is telling me about. So if the seed is coming from phi to the four, then uh, from some phi to the four contact interaction, then the result will be a particular self-interaction of the massless scalar. If the seed is coming from exchange of a particle of mass m, then the result will be exchange of a particle of same mass. Okay. And in case you have to calculate theta separately or in each case theta is same in all the different- Ah, yeah, yeah, no, so it's the same. Yeah, I see. It's the same. There, yeah, if you wanna, right, let me be super careful, yeah. So, if I'm just talking about scalar exchanges, ah, sorry, yeah. So there are two things, yeah. So if all I'm doing is changing the 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 mass conformally coupled scalar to massless scalar, then actually these operators are always the same. Okay. Now there is another thing that you can do to go from scalar internal lag to spinning internal lag. And then the operator is different depending on the external weight here. But now if all, I'm, if all I want to do is take a diagram with massive exchange and end up with a new diagram of massive exchange where the external particles are the only things that are changing from conformally coupled scalars to massless scalars, then the operator is the same, regardless of whether it's three level or uh, context process or three level exchange or even three level exchange of a spinning particle. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. All right. Very good. So, so now let's describe a bit the dynamics of a context versus exchange exchange diagrams. So before I do that, just uh, uh, let me just say a couple words about uh, about the Sitter space and its kinematics. So DS kinematics. So we, we are going to work in cosmological slicing where the metric ds squared equals minus d squared plus dx squared over h squared eta squared. And uh, it has 10 isometries, very important for us. 10 isometries. So six of them are obvious, right? The x goes to x plus a, translations. That's why we go to Fourier space. And, and so we have three of these. We have three rotations where x goes to some rotation matrix times x. Um, then we have one dilation that's uh, by now familiar, but slightly unusual. We rescale uh, space and time, and the eta squared downstairs cancel the, cancels the rescaling. And finally, there are three special conformal that uh, actually I usually don't write, but I, I recently realized there's a simple way of writing them. Uh, three special conformal that uh, you, can, you can generate by composition of inversion, translation, 
inversion, um, where inversion is the is the disconnected operation of the, of sending eta to eta divided by minus eta squared plus x squared and x to x divided by minus eta squared plus x squared. So there, are at, in particular, as eta goes to zero, it goes to the usual inversions of conformal field theory. Okay, so that's why they are related to the special conformal transformations of the conformal group. Okay? If you run an inversion plus a translation plus another inversion, you're gonna get a, a so-called the Seeder boosts, which are kind of non-trivial from to see from this uh, from this uh, form of the metric. So now one nice thing about uh, about working with those uh, with those uh, conformally coupled scalars is that we can diagonalize nine of them for free and we only have one left over to diagonalize we have 5k1 5k2 5k3 5k4 uh, which at late times goes like eta to the four you're gonna have some delta function of the sum of the three momenta we diagonalize the uh, translations and the rotations are also simple to diagonalize. Then um, if we diagonalize uh, dilatations for these weights, it turns out that all we need to do is pull some scale of momentum up front that I'm gonna, gonna call S. And then we're gonna have some dimensionless function of uh, two variables that I'm gonna call U and V, okay? And uh, let me define these things a little bit more carefully. I have the four point function, I'm agnostic right now, where it comes from. Actually, let me put a blob here uh, K1, K2, K3, K4, some S channel type of diagram. So then I'm going to call K1 plus K2 vector. It's absolute value, I'm going to call it S, which is what I'm writing here. Just in analogy with S Mandelstam, even though it has the different dimension, it has dimension of uh, momentum, okay, one over length. And the U and V are going to be um, U S divided by okay. So if if I write these ansatz here for the four point function, and I uh, for m squared equals two. It corresponds to conformal dimension delta equals two. So that UVs are the uh, cross ratios. They are the well. We chose U and V, of course, because of cross ratios. But they are they are morally equivalent, but they're not quite cross ratios because uh, they don't diagonalize all the Sitter isometries. Okay. So cross ratios make the action of the conformal group trivial, right? I can write any function of cross ratios. Here, uh, we are focusing on, uh, on generic scalar type exchange. And then it turns out that this almost does the job of uh, that conformal cross ratios do for you. But uh, there's still one leftover symmetry constraint. Okay. okay. Yeah, so they are, that's, that, that was the motivation, but they're not quite conformal cross ratios. So what the left, the last isometry is one of these special conformal transformations. So we did almost everything. Two of the special conformal transformations immediately annihilate this form of the four point function, but the, the last one doesn't and will give us some differential constraint, which is uh, delta U F, uh, of u and v of delta v u and v, or this delta is some hypergeometric operator. Um, 
Okay. So I have this uh, partial differential equation in two variables, and then anything that solves this PDE is a good solution of the of the kinematical constraints. Sorry, I have a question. Please. Yeah. Please. Uh, uh, Phi four point function that's generally a function of six variables, right? Uh, like k1 dot k2, k1 dot k3, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, mod t1 square. Uh, how do you, uh, you know, in Poisson space it was it is quite clear that it can be reduced to uh, two variables, but in the momentum space, how do you know it can be reduced to this function? Yeah, of I'm, I'm just telling you. Yeah, it's not uh, obvious, but uh, if you if you try imposing one by one. So, for example, as you said, I can start imposing translations, then I go to momentum space, I just pick a delta function, eliminate three variables, right? Rotations tell me that uh, the vectors only appear in scalar products. Then dilatation tell me that I'm, I have something covariant if I rescale all the momenta, and that's the power of covariance. So, I'm, I'm, I went through them very quickly. and. And then there are these three ones that are hard. And now I'm just telling without proof, and but you can check that uh, out of these three, two of them will give you zero equals zero, as long as you write your four point function to depend on these two variables here, okay? And then the last constraint tells you that this function is not arbitrary, it has to solve this uh, differential equation. So is it true for only set of interaction that you are taking and then uh, only for a particular set of, you know, exchanges that you are taking or? Uh... Yeah, it's uh, true as long as, um, if you, you think in CFT language, it's related to uh, some sort of conformal block decomposition in which I'm exchanging scalar operators. In particular, the moments that the internal particle is spinning uh, will, will be such that the, the, the general answer, even in the S channel, will not depend only on these two variables. But it will, it will be a function of more variables, but the dependence on all the other kinematical variables is completely fixed again by conformal symmetry. Is the choice of U and V is partly because uh, you're using this conformally coupled scalars and and they are basically exponential, so they add at the... Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, from the bulk, uh, the reason why you would uh, imagine that such a thing can, can happen is because if I compose two conformally coupled mode functions, they go like eta squared into the i k1 plus k2 eta, right? But now if I do the same for massless, mode functions, they will go like one plus i k one eta, one plus i k two eta. So here it's just a function of the sum. Well, here it depends on the sum and the products, right? Uh, but the, the particular dependence on the product is fixed by conformal symmetry. So that's what those uh, differential operators automatically do for you. Okay. So that's why this was a useful stepping stone, just because here the functional dependence is quite simple and then everything else follows from those uh, kinematical moves. Any more questions? Okay, so, so that's all kinematics. So we just got to the point of how oh, a generic four point function depends, uh, or in, in S matrix language, it's the analog of a, a flat space S matrix depends on two Mandelstam, Mandelstam variables, okay? So now we need to input some dynamics. And uh, the dynamics, Yeah, the dynamics comes in in, uh, in uh, which solutions we're taking. So contacts solutions, they will have the simplest possible analytic structure, essentially because the only place where something interesting happens in, during, during inflation is the moment where all the fluctuations are sourced. In other words, there is a particular instance in time 
you have to sum over this instance, but it's unique where all four fluctuations are sourced. So you have the simplest possible analytic structure. Okay. And uh, to get a taste for what the analytic structure is, it, it's easy to compute something from the bulk. So the simplest example would come from lambda phi to the fourth. And then if you do the computation of lambda phi to the fourth, the four point function will be given by lambda divided by k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4. Where uh, k1 is just the absolute value of the momentum k1, okay? So uh, in the case of a scattering amplitude uh, for phi to the four, the scattering amplitude would just be minus i lambda or something like that, right? And the difference between this diagram and the usual scattering amplitude diagram is that here conformal time runs from minus infinity to zero. So instead of doing the time integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the i total energy eta, the eta. In cosmology, we run from minus infinity to zero. Okay, so late times are conformal time going to zero. So that's why we get these uh, one over total energy, even though there's no energy conservation. Here, there would be a delta function of energy conservation. And here, the energy is downstairs at lambda over total energy. Okay. In particular, if I if I send e to zero, send e to zero, which is unphysical in the cosmological sheets, you have to make some of the absolute values of the momenta go negative. But if you analytically continue and, and consider these limits. You're essentially forcing the integral to peak at very early times. Okay, the early time suppression that would uh, usually be there from the wild oscillations of the exponential they disappear. So then the integral is dominated by very early times. I'm forcing this process to happen at very early times, and the residue on the pole is the scattering amplitude. Okay, so the cosmological correlator. In these limits, goes to one over e times the flat space scattering amplitude. So this is a very nice result, and it's general. The particular power of energy that you're going to get depends on the particular process that you that you have in the bulk. But it's a general fact that if I have a certain cosmological correlator and I try to send the total energy of the process to zero, I'll get something singular. And uh, the leading singularity has coefficients that is Lorentz invariant and is related to a flat space scattering process. So in that sense, cosmological contain flat space scattering amplitudes. Is it the analog of the bulk um, uh, point singularity in ADS-CFT? It's... Uh, it, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar. It's very similar to that. Yes, I would say so. The, the bulk point singularity, there is some extra story there of, uh, of uh, the bulk being stringy versus the bulk being effective field theory-like. So uh, in particular, if, uh, so when we take these limits, we're probing the high energy limits of the scattering amplitude. So if it came from string theory, we know that the high energy limit of string theory is very different from the high energy limit of uh, QFT. So uh, we expect the cosmological correlator to be singular as we send e to zero in any quantum field theory, but we expect it to actually be smooth in string theory. So even if you, don't know how to compute a stringy cosmological correlator from a world sheet or something like that. We know one consistency requirement related to this bulk point singularity, which is that it should have a smooth e total going to zero limit. It should not be singular. Okay. And then when you send e total to zero, you should get something Lorentz invariant and uh, with similar Reggie like behavior with exponential suppression of the cosmological correlator. Yeah. 
All right, so, so, so this is the baby version of this story for the simplest example of lambda phi to the fourth. So in particular, uh, contact interactions have a single, sing, they have a unique singularity. The only singularity is when E goes to zero. So if I have a solution, so again, it's related to some earlier questions. So the kinematical constraints will give me a big, a big like a, a universe of possibilities. Uh, but then, yeah, but then uh, if I just focus on those possibilities for which the, you, the only singular point is a singular point in which E total goes to zero, then I know that I'm talking about a contact process in the bulk, okay, during inflation. So in particular, this will give me a strategy of how to um, find pretty much, well, not all possible, but almost all possible context diagrams. So now that I know one example, I can bootstrap infinitely many of them by the following idea. So if we go back to that uh, notation of pi k1, pi k4, one over s, f of s over, k1 plus k2, s over k3 plus k4. And we know that for the simplest context diagram, f of u and v is given by this, u v divided by u plus v. And, uh, and uh, this will solve our kinematical constraints. You're welcome to check that delta u f equals delta v f, okay? Uh, but now consider the following um, F1 delta UF, okay? If I take this uh, particular, particular function of U and V, uh, it's gonna recall that this is an operator with two derivatives. So we're gonna get U plus V cubed with some numerator that depends on U and V. Uh, but it satisfies all the constraints you see. Uh, well, we, we only have one constraint to, to satisfy, right? Delta U F1 equals Delta V F1. But if F1 is Delta U F, I can just pull the Delta U up front. So it's automatically satisfied. Okay, so it's okay. So this is a new, new solution. And I can repeat this forever. So I can just get a general basis of contact diagrams. It's gonna be F contact. It's gonna be a sum a n delta u to the n of the simplest. Okay, so every time I apply a delta u, because I'm getting a higher power of energy, I'm probing a more irrelevant interaction in the box. So this guy, for example, would come from some uh, phi squared, d phi squared type of interaction in the bulk. If I did it again, I would get something with u plus v to the fifth, which would come from d phi to the four. So I can generate uh, almost everything that's possible from effective field theory by just hitching delta u over and over. Uh, without knowing the detail of the theory, you can directly write down this. That's right, yeah. So the, your power as an effective field theory will be in dialing these coefficients. Yeah. Okay. But the actual shape of the scattering amplitude or of the cosmological correlator is uh, fixed, the momentum dependence. Okay. So that's the, we expect in the standard effective field theory, a n to go like h over the cutoff, so a certain power that depends on n probably. Uh, so we expect it to be more and more suppressed, but uh, no matter what physics is generating those uh, that effective field theory for you, this will be the general shape of the four point function. I have one quick question. Uh, so del u was a second or differential equation. And here you are writing down a few v, uh, but, but in general, what is the boundary condition? Do you need to put in some boundary condition to solve it or? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I do. And uh, I already did in the sense that I, I require the solution to only be singular as uh, e goes to zero. So it's regular in all the, all the other uh, possible uh, singular points. But um, yeah, so here I'm just picking one family of possible solutions of the kinematical constraints. And uh, now when I discuss exchange, I'll show you that boundary conditions will select uh, particular, particular solution of the equations of the kinematical constraints that will tell me something about which dynamical process is going on. Here, the only input of dynamics, um, I, I, I'm not really solving the differential equation. I found a solution and I'm generating a, a, an infinite number of other solutions. And um, I, I know from this flat space limits that is almost exhaustive because it's matching what we expect uh, flat space scattering amplitudes from contact interactions to look like. And the only real inputs from the point of view of dynamics is that the only singular point is the singular point where the total goes to zero. So if there were any other singularities, any other singular points, then uh, it would mean that it's not quite just uh, contact interaction that's happening in the bulk. Okay. All right, so am I out of time actually? Sayanta, are you there? Uh, you can continue, I don't have any problem. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how it works for exchange. And yeah. Then, uh, I'll finish and then people want to. Yeah, yeah, the main motivation is to learn. So I don't have any time restriction in that. Way. Okay, I can, yeah, let, okay. I'll, I'll continue and then uh, we'll, we'll see. I think I can do the exchange part in a few minutes. and then say a bit about spin. So, um, yeah, so for the case of exchange, then the previous question about boundary conditions will become very important. And um, yeah, so again, kinematics tells me delta U F equals delta V F. And uh, here's some intuition. When the mass of the particle is very heavy, and the mass is very big, I want this to reduce to a contact like diagram, okay? And uh, another piece of intuition is that if I have a, a scattering amplitude, exchange of a massive particle, then there is something that I can do to the scattering amplitude that will reduce it to a context diagram, which is I multiply by the klein gordon operator, S minus M squared, acting on this equals to the context diagram, okay? So these two pieces of intuition, and I can give you others, uh, will, will tell me that uh, this is what I should be looking for. Uh, multiplying by delta u because I'm generating higher and higher powers of, uh, of uh, some object that in the flat space limit is related to higher powers of Mandelstam tells me that I should think of delta u as like Mandelstam, like here. Okay? Because the things are dimensionless. So I, I have a question. I, uh, sorry. Uh, the, this particle exchange you are considering as a scalar particle or? Scalar, yeah. Because uh, as I said uh, 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 a few minutes ago, if we understand the scalar exchange, the spin exchange follows from kinematical moves, okay? okay. It's a bit like uh, in the case of flat space, if I have the, the scalar exchange diagram, the scattering amplitude goes like this, one over S minus M squared. And if I wanna get spinning exchange, I take the same object and I multiply it by some uh, Legendre polynomial that will depend on the spin, we call it L of the particle, and, and the second Mandelstam 
one plus two t divided by square. And is there any restriction on the spin? Yeah, so the spin of the particle appears here. So it can be any integer spin. Okay. Yeah. In particular, well, this formula needs to work out in such a way that if I send the mass to zero, this should go to uh, t to the l divided by s for massless spin l. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so this is the intuition. And uh, and then the, the equation that we're going to, and we can justify it, we do it in a few different ways in the paper. Um, the equation looks like this. Uh, it's dimensionless, so it shouldn't surprise you that the object that will appear is the mass of the particle in Hubble units. M over h squared. And if I'm being very careful, I think there is a minus 2 here. Times f exchange. I'm going to call this F exchange equals the simplest complex diagram that I wrote here. Okay, so this is the equation that I need to solve. So this is a complex like diagram, like this one, and this is some Klein Gordon like operator. Now collapse the internal propagator and get me something uh, context-like. Moreover, if I make the mass very big, if I make the mass very big, I can erase this and I get just contact solution. And uh, I can even try to make this a little bit uh, less um, uh, wobbly. I could imagine. This is a formal solution, not uh, the, the true solution. I could imagine writing um, F exchange very roughly as, uh, let me call this uh, uh, mu, mu squared. Okay, for mu going to infinity, I can uh, write it as one over mu squared u v divided by u plus v minus delta u over mu squared one over mu squared u v divided by u plus v plus ta ta ta. Okay, I'm just uh, expanding, just putting this on the right on uh, the denominator and expanding powers of one over mu. So is it delta u or delta u inverse? Uh, it's delta u because I'm taking one over delta u. Oh, okay. Plus mu squared and writing this one over mu squared. Right. Okay. Just Taylor explaining this. And fr from where these two terms come? This uh, uh, minus two, this side. Your. Uh, uh, this? No, 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 here, here, uh, this side, yeah. This? To, yeah. This is just from being careful, okay? Uh, I, I'm just, um, I was just, yeah. If you wish, this is what I would call mass of the new state. Okay. Uh, but if you really track things back to what the usual meaning of mass is and so on, uh, this would be the S matrix definition of mass. It's usually pole mass in the scattering amplitude. This would be the analog of pole mass uh, in the case of a cosmological correlator. But what we usually write down as the mass of the scalar field translates into this particular formula. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's just an identification of this parameter with the mass that appears in the Lagrangian. Okay, but. But now recall that delta u acting on, on these are just contact solutions. So I'm just reproducing effective field theory. I get some pi to the four plus some su things suppressed by this mu scale coming from some uh, more irrelevant operator, delta phi squared, 
or so on. Okay, so this is like effective field theory. Mm, yes. Okay. But now, uh, going back to the question, this is not, uh, it's a good expansion at large mu, but it's not a good expansion around any particular kinematical channel in the variables u and v. Okay, now if I want to solve the equation around a particular value of u and v, I need to specify boundary conditions. And it's a second order differential equation. I need to specify two boundary conditions. And if, I, if I'm being careful about this operator, delta u is u squared. Here by this formula. There are three singular points, which is when this operator goes to zero u goes to zero and u goes to plus or minus one. Okay, so these points are dangerous or, or need to be uh, looked at carefully. So as u goes to plus one, it means that uh, s goes to k1 plus k2, uh, which, uh, which is essentially this limit where I take the momenta k1 and k2 to be lined up. Keep momenta k3 and k4 generic. Okay, so in these limits, I'm just uh, making them collinear, and there is nothing going wrong. But generically, the solution of the differential equation could be singular. So I have to go to these limits and impose that the solution is regular, and this is related to selecting the initial states. Regularity. as u goes to plus one, uh, selects bunch Davis. Now as u goes to my, so if I want to talk about alpha vacua and so on, I could relax the, this condition. But uh, again, I, I, I don't want to go there. I, I'm just seeking to standard bunch Davis, initial conditions, and that will pick. Uh, that will tell me that I want the solution to be regular. Otherwise, it will be singular as I take, as I send you to plus one. As u goes to minus one, then something interesting happens. As u goes to minus one, I'm essentially sending the sum of the energies going into the left vertex to zero. As u goes to minus one, then k1 plus k2 plus s is going to zero. So it's a bit like the example that I was talking about earlier of sum of energies going to zero. But uh, in, the, in the previous example, I was sending the sum of the energies entering the vertex going to zero for all external particles. Here, uh, it's the sum of energies entering this vertex is going to zero. So in this limit, this object factorizes. So I want this object to factorize. So I want this to become the product of a three-point scattering amplitude on the left, because I'm pushing this to zero, uh, sorry, to very early times. So it should become a three-point scattering amplitude on the left times three points cosmological correlator on the right, where this is the particle of mass M. And now uh, here in this product, I am uh, hiding the distinction that was asked earlier in the talk between whether I'm computing the wave function of the universe or I'm computing the cosmological correlator. What I mean here by three point function on the right, will have a slightly different interpretation if I'm looking at cosmological correlator versus, versus a, a wave function of the universe, okay? But uh, intuitively, the idea is that I am just pushing this point to very early times, keeping this point untouched, okay? So the idea is that I, I should get something singular, but the coefficient of the singularity, in detail, it's a log 
you're going to be some log of 1 plus u. But the coefficient of the log should be given by three point functions. Three point scattering amplitude on the left, and three point cosmological correlator with the particle of mass m on the right. So these are the boundary conditions. Two boundary conditions of the variable u. So I right. want to mean that here the both the things can be uh, so this can be factorizable in the two parts. Yeah. So so that's right. So it's a boundary condition. It's, oh, okay. uh, I, I demand that it, that it factorizes. So to select the right solution, I want it to be regular. That fixes part of it. So I still have freedom. Mm -hmm. And the leftover freedom I use to demand regular that to demand that in the singular point that I can't remove, but it's okay. It's in the physical sheet. When I go there, I, I demand that it factorizes as these uh, products of uh, scattering amplitude and cosmological correlator. Okay. Okay. And then uh, as u goes to zero, I have no freedom left over. But then I discovered something nice. I discovered that there is spontaneous particle production. Okay, so that's the novelty of the sitter, which is not visible here in this effective field theory expansion. So demanding the right boundary conditions in u going to plus or minus one will imply, uh, ah, notice that as u goes to zero, all of these terms go to zero, no? U, u, everything goes to zero. Uh, but demanding these boundary conditions will force me to add some homogeneous solutions to the differential equation that I removed that, that will force me to have some exponentially small e to the minus m over h uh, times u to i m over h maybe plus I think there is a question type of uh, term. Yeah? Question? Yeah, sorry. So I had a question. Uh, so u goes to minus one, you know, uh, you expect the singularity to be both uh, both ways, right? Not only the left part to factorize, but also it can be right part also can factorize. So u goes to minus one implies both the limit? No, no, no. You have to do the same story for v. Oh, one should do the same story for v. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are two ordinary differential equations, one in u, one in v. And then uh, it's second order on u for fixed v, second order on v for fixed u. So you have four boundary conditions, and it's the exactly mirror story for v. And uh, the fact that the, they solve delta u equals delta v, and maybe I didn't stress this point. Uh, delta u plus mu squared f equals com compact solution and delta v plus mu squared f equals contacts implies in particular when I subtract these delta u equals delta v if I if if I yeah if I had different equations, different contact terms, for example, on the right hand side, this would not be true. And this could not possibly come from consistent time evolution. They wouldn't correspond to the particle consistently propagating. So the fact that I'm solving both u and v and imposing these boundary conditions in both u and v is what fixes something completely consistent with uh, both time evolution on the right and on the left. So uh, one more question is that suppose I don't put in the regularity at u is equal to one plus one. Uh, I, do I need to put a boundary condition near u is equal to zero? Because here for ah, you, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I don't quite know. Um, yeah, I don't quite know if you can use it as an input. So some bound, some bound. Yeah. That's a good question. Presumably, there is a way of, uh, of uh, demanding some property of spontaneous particle production as you send u to zero. Essentially, yeah, maybe it's possible. It, uh, when you send u to zero, what you're doing is you have this four point function and you're giving very long wavelength to these new states. 
So what these two particles, the, the, what the pairs of uh, scalar external probes are doing for you is they are measuring the two-point function of the new states. Essentially, you're just measuring straight up the two-point function of these uh, internal states. And the two-point function of a massive particle in the sitter will always have this exponentially small piece coming from spontaneous pair production. So maybe there is a story there where you fix a boundary condition as u goes to zero, that you're measuring the two-point function of the scalar particle, and then you will learn that as you go to one of these other limits that it factorizes in a way consistent with flat space dynamics. But that's not, that's not how we did it. It's not an initial value type of problem, right? So it's a, where you put boundary conditions a bit up to you. But once you fix a couple of them, the, the, the other part of the answer is a, re, is a result. In our case, uh, spontaneous particle production is a consequence rather than an input. Mm. Very good. So, yeah, I am uh, getting a little bit out of uh, control with time. So, let me maybe try to wrap up here, and then uh, people want to stay a little bit more. I can say a few words about tensors. But um, yeah, this this story I think is just getting started. Uh, this is a uh, something that we did over the past couple of years. Now we are, I think we understand um, the story for these models of slow roll inflation, how to get inflationary four and three point functions of scalars. There are many interesting questions um, that uh, I still don't know how to understand them. How do you run this bootstrap for other classes of inflationary models, maybe time dependent masses? models in which the inflaton has a small speed of sound. They're phenomenologically very interesting. Uh, maybe these models with uh, so-called fast turning trajectories and so on, uh, in which isocurvature plays an important role. I don't know how, how the story works there. And uh, we just started to understand the story for the senior space of uh, spinning correlators. But I think that the most important lesson is that uh, any interesting piece of physics related to either the conformal bootstrap or to the S matrix must teach us something about the structure of cosmological correlators. So I hope that uh, I made that clear throughout the talk. So I, I, I was mostly discussing the simple example of just three level exchange because it's phenomenologically the um, probably the most interesting one, but I think that there's still a lot structurally that needs to be understood about the, about the, um, the general shapes and uh, what can you constrain, what's possible, what's not possible. Can we say something about the, not just the shapes, but the sizes of cosmological correlators? And there is some precedent in saying something related to that in the MBS matrix. And in CFT, that's the whole point of the conformal bootstrap. So I think that it's a ripe field for, for, for new ideas and uh, new discoveries to be made. So I'll, I will stop here. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry that I went way over time. Uh, it's a really very nice uh, discussion and uh, you have given quite detailed uh, derivation so that people can understand. So anybody can ask question. Before that, we have to clap for uh, Pimentel for giving such a nice talk. So, and uh, now you guys can ask question. And if you want, then I would ask Pimentel to talk about Tensor a little bit. Sure. Okay, I'm happy to do that. But are, are there any more questions about the scalar part? Yeah, so people can ask questions if you have, then he can extend this a little bit for tensor. Mm -hmm.
All right, so the novelty for tensors is that uh, um, there is a very subtle breaking of boosts that uh, is not the case for scalars. And that, that, uh, that's, uh, that gives us some non-trivial constraints. Okay, so that's the, the one, the 20 second summary. I'll give you a bit more detail. So in the, in the case of the scalars, I could focus on scalars exchanging any states of any mass, any spin, no problem whatsoever. I can even write down this S channel diagram and go home, okay? And there is no problem. No inconsistency. Now, once the external particle is spinning and light, then uh, there, there are non-trivial constraints, okay? Because we want to demand that the spinning particle propagates the right number of degrees of freedom. So the, the analogy, so for example, if we're interested uh, in the case of uh, one a photon or one gluon interacting with the scalar fluctuations. Okay. You could imagine drawing a diagram like this, in which uh, the photon uh, exchanges a certain scalar particle here. But that diagram by itself will be inconsistent. Okay. And how do you see that? The idea is the following. So now our object is going to be a correlation function of, say, um, gauge potential of the photon or, or of the gluon or something like that, AI um, of K1, and then maybe some scalar fluctuations, phi K2, phi K3, phi K4. But now the point is that we measure certain polarization. So we contract this with a polarization vector, psi i, associated to momentum k, k1. OK? And uh, let's go back to uh, flat space uh, scattering amplitudes for a second. So the final diagrams, so when I draw like, a final diagram like this, Feynman diagrams produce for us nice Lorentz covariant tensors. Okay? So Feynman diagram will easily for us generate uh, some covariant vector because there is a there is an index here associated to to the external photon a mu. It will depend on k one to k four or maybe p one to p four for momentum. But then I have to contract this with polarization, polarization vector, epsilon mu of P1. And the whole point is that polarization vectors, for, so the, the main point is that polarization vectors are not Lorentz vectors. If I, in particular, if I boost epsilon mu of P1 will not go to, uh, maybe there is a boost matrix lambda mu nu, epsilon mu. So this would be a boost transformation of, uh, of, uh, of a usual Lorentz vector, but no, uh, um, polarization vector can generically transform to, some, uh, to something proportional Okay. proportional to P mu itself. Okay, so that's bad. It means that when I do this contraction, I don't get a Lorentz scalar. So what do we learn in quantum field theory? We learn that uh, we want our final object to be such that P mu and mu, P1 mu equals zero which we call gauge invariance, usually. But 
But what it really means is that we want the final scattering amplitude to be Lorentz invariant. Okay, so we want to eliminate this arbitrary dependence. Uh, so in order for th this guy to really transform like a Lorentz vector would be, uh, would transform, we want the final contracted object to not depend on this arbitrary uh, piece here. Okay, so there is something very similar that will happen for our case. So from the weight shifting technology, that uh, that I mentioned um, during the talk, I can obtain a spinning cosmological correlator by some sort of a operator acting on a scalar four-point function. Okay, so I take a scalar four-point function, and there is some operator that will spin up this leg, for example. Okay, spin. So I take a scalar external leg and take it to a spinning external leg. And if I adjust the conformal dimension of this, uh, of this guy here, then uh, you'd, you'd probably be okay, you'd be happy. I have a, a vector particle with the right conformal dimension that would correspond to mass squared equals zero. But the point is that um, if we want this particle to propagate the right number of degrees of freedom, it has uh, three indices. So naively it has three degrees of freedom. So we need a shortening condition. And the shortening condition is something like AI, AI equals to zero, okay? When we contract the polar, this, uh, this uh, gauge field with a polarization vector, we are precisely killing off any bits that would uh, carry information about longitudinal modes. But then uh, there's some nice story here because this object seems to be completely consistent with the Sitter isometries, but and that's not quite true. If I apply boosts, the Sitter boosts to this four point function, there will be something non trivial showing up. Okay, so let me uh, explain how that happens. If I, if I take a, a, this correlator, psi i a i, and then let's just stick to the simplest example, k1, okay, phi k2, phi k3, phi k4, and I apply boost, the sitter boost, the analog of the delta u minus delta v, um, Naively, I would demand that it's zero, okay? But what happens is that the polarization vector also depends on the momentum. So when I apply the boost operator to this combination, I pick something so that I have to boost in a certain direction. So in the end, after some calculation, you get something like this. B is the direction, is the three vector pointing the direction of the boost. I get something proportional to B dot psi times k i a i k i i okay so i get something like this and now we need to demand our shortening condition okay k i a i should be zero but yeah, and this is a, a subtle point. Ki is zero um, when all points are separated in, in the sky, okay? In other words, if I go to position space, di, ai of x, i of y, i of w, I have the four points here in space, x, y, z, w. This is zero as long as x, y, z, w are all separated. But when x, when any of these points collide, 
I have uh, context contributions, which means that the um, in order for this uh, uh, this thing to propagate the right number of degrees of freedom, uh, I, I actually this is not quite zero. It's zero up to context terms, and the context terms measure some property or the coupling of these uh, of these spinning particle to each of the scalar particles. Okay, so that's not quite zero anymore. It's going to be proportional to delta of x minus phi times something, delta of x minus z times something, delta of x minus w times something. Okay. Now, when I Fourier transform, this gets all mixed up. I'll get some analytic terms. But it's not delta function, there is move. Okay. So there is going to be some specific right hand side. So that, that's uh, essentially the point. So now you have to solve, instead of solving some inhomogeneous, or instead of solving some homogeneous differential equation from kinematics, like delta u equals delta v, like we did for the scalars, now we have some specific inhomogeneous equation that we have to solve. The, the, the action of boosts is proportional to some something related to lower point correlation functions of these uh, scalars. And um, that's the main novelty of doing spinning operators. And these inhomogeneous solutions, they're very special. That's how you discover from the, from the point of view of the bootstrap, for example, that uh, a photon couples to external particles in a way that is consistent with charge conservation. Okay. So if you try to violate charge conservation, you will not be able to satisfy boost symmetry. Now, if you repeat this exercise for the case of the graviton, you discover the equivalence principle. You discover that gravitational fluctuations cannot couple uh, with different strengths to, to different species. So this particular diagram, for example, would be completely inconsistent because um, if this is a photon, you want to couple to some process with total charge equals zero, where charge is conserved, but it moreover wants to couple to all charged particles. So if I want the total charge to be zero, I need to assign opposite charges to at least a pair of particles. Then the photon couples to one of them and must also couple to at least one more of them. So you see that only a certain cost of conspiration of exchange channels will give you something that satisfies that boost identity. So that's how you discover things like the equivalence principle, charge conservation, and uh, the structure of young mills theory, and so on. So that's the main novelty okay. of, uh, of uh, spinning particles. If you're interested in, uh, in uh, adding, so okay, once you found the solution to this, uh, to this uh, differential equation here, you're always free to add to it homogeneous pieces. You can write the general four point function as something that gives you the right hand side plus some homogeneous pieces. And the homogeneous pieces we can produce by some weight shifting procedure very analogous to the one that I described during the talk for scalars. So that's the story for spinning particles. So the main new ingredient is that boosts are broken in a very subtle way and uh, classifying these uh, solutions that subtly break boosts teaches new principles of physics related to charge conservation and the equivalence principle and so on, but in a cosmological setting. So in particular, if we want to obtain that uh, Maldacena three-point function of uh, two gravitons and a scalar, it comes from a four-point function of two scalars and two gravitons, and then there will be various diagrams. Okay. Mm -hmm. There will be a diagram coming from graviton exchange, which is the one that I drew in the beginning of the talk. 
but there will, in order for things to be fully consistent, you will also need you will also need to add uh, um, the very honest. These are temperature fluctuations. Then I need to add diagram to look like this. Okay. So there is a particular, because the graviton couples with equal strength to itself and to scalars, mm -hmm. the four point function, actually this hadn't been computed before. So the four point function will involve a particular conspiration of these various exchange channels in order for us to solve this boost identity. Then when you take the soft limit to get the three point function, it just so happens that these diagrams with scalar exchange don't contribute. Uh, but this one does. And then we get one thing here. So that's the story for spinning particles. So <clears throat> guys, uh, you have any question on this part? Anybody? I have a question from uh, one uh, thing. You please uh, ask. Hello? Yeah, yeah, you please ask. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, one of the comments you made was U goes to zero limit is like spontaneous production. Uh, how do I think about that? I, I'm not very really clear. Why should I? But, uh, how to relate spontaneous production to uh, this kind of discussion? Yeah, yeah. So, U goes to zero is the very soft limit of the internal lag. So, When u goes to zero, I am the key. I am uh, essentially taking the momenta configuration like this. Okay. K one, K two. So this is S. K three, K four. So then the, the, the physical wavelength of these, uh, of these uh, fluctuations is very long. Okay. So I'm essentially measuring its two point function and uh, the dominant part of the long, the long distance dominant part of the two point function is coming from spontaneous pair production. If you just study the two point function of a massive field in the sitter, at long distances, it's dominated by spontaneous pair production. Okay, right. that, that's the that's the idea. Okay. Okay. So that's the yeah. Any more questions? You know, one more question. You know, all this discussion is about like uh, you uh, you have spontaneous production and then you get correlation function. But uh, you know, uh, one can imagine to have some classical correlation uh, in the bulk, which give rise to uh, this kind of correlation. Uh, are you allowing for those in your discussion? Yeah, I don't know. They will generically have these uh, singularities when. Uh, the singularities uh, that we, one way of thinking about this uh, modified initial states is that there's some uh, uh, hard process happening early on in inflation. So there's some classicalized uh, uh, fluctuations at, at the beginning of inflation. And um, generically, you will have these uh, singularities when uh, momenta become collinear, okay? So this will, I think this is the generic signature of uh, classical processes happening during, in, during inflation. This is uh, discussed in a recent paper by Green and Porto and uh, essentially comes about because of the difference between retard and refinement 
type of uh, propagators. Okay, so if you if you have like for example retarded propagators uh, coming from classical evolution, uh, and if you run the cosmological correlator star, you will see uh, that uh, they will generically have these uh, type of uh, collinear singularities. Well, for the Feynman type of uh, propagators of, uh, of particles and antiparticles in a quantum process, you will not have those um, those um, those singularities. But uh, yeah, I think that the the uh, simple answer to your question is I don't know how to how to do it uh, how to have the classical sources. Because uh, usually they will also break some symmetries, right? So you need to take that into account. Um, you have to put the source somewhere. You pick a point. You pick the, some region or some slice in time in which uh, the classical source kicks in and so on. So the set of symmetries that you have at your disposal will be smaller. Um, how about one loop corrections? Um, I guess there's a lot of debate about what one loop is in Sitter. And with these methods, um, I don't know like what your point of view is about doing loop computations. Is it is it is it is D Sitter stable or is this back reaction? Like Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that the uh, we need to understand loops in order to settle this question. Uh, understand things like cutting rules and um, and uh, yeah the general story that uh, people know in flat space of uh, infrared singularities the uh, factorization and so on and, uh, we have a limited understanding uh, there are some um, data some examples computed by uh, uh, Richard Woodard uh, a series of collaborators as a also, some particular examples uh, with the senatorias, Aldariaga, uh, myself, and uh, more recently, Senatoria Gorbenko, also some other papers on Lambda Phi to the Fourth Theory in DS. Uh, and there, I think that they're bypassing the issue of diagrammatics. I think it's, uh, there was a nice recent paper by Aaron Hillman that looked at the bubble diagram in the sitter, used some interesting symbology to extract quite a bit about the one loop bubble diagram in the sitter. But I think uh, it's fair to say that we don't understand when these infrared effects are important, when they are not. And uh, there's all of these, uh, there are the, the, the objections of Polyakov and Akhmedov and, uh, that uh, maybe these back reaction effects become important. In certain setups, you can prove that they're, they're harmless. Uh, in, other, in other examples, we know that they give uh, important corrections, right? The eternal inflation, in some sense, is a, is a very important quantum effect. But I, I think that uh, from a pragmatic point of view, understanding one loop is the first uh, thing that should be done with as many external legs as possible. Understand this bubble triangle box decomposition that we have for amplitudes, knowing cutting rules, what are the ingredients, trying to understand the analytic structure, infrared issues. I think there it's extremely important if in the end, it turns out that they're irrelevant for weak recouple theories. At least we can sleep knowing that the inflationary predictions are reliable. And I think that it's still uh, not fully settled. So I think it's an extremely important problem. Yep. Any more questions, guys, you have? I think not. All right. Well, so, thank you very much. Thank you Sorry, for I went way, so, way, way, way over time. But uh, no, no, it's very good, and you have given 
a very long uh, intro. So I will send you the link of your talk after uploading. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So just to mention, next talk is by Professor Eva Silverstein uh, on Thursday. And then Monday, there is a talk by Matias Zaldariaga from IAS Princeton. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for your attention and uh, stay safe, everyone. Yeah. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.